Alaska. America's last wilderness. Kodiak Island. 3,000 bears. We got up to 116 bears on Connecticut Creek within its a area probably, or a length of creek probably about four miles or so. There's all kinds of social behavior going on, not among family members, but across families. We'd see many young adults playing together, wrestling, and occasionally we'd see a big boar coming by and join in with them. Those weren't things that we were expecting. Scientists from the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge are studying brown bears to understand their movement, habitat use, and to find ways of lessening the impact of human development. The opportunity is almost unique to Kodiak Island. In the words of one researcher, we don't often get the chance to work in areas that have been untouched, observing the species in its natural environment prior to human disturbance. This project pretty much started to test out some recent technologies that have been developed this year. We captured 28 bears. We had darted from a helicopter with a dart gun that's got darts filled with telazole, the drug that we used to immobilize them, and put GPS collars on 22 and VHF collars on another three. The GPS collars will give us a location once every hour throughout the season. It also gives us activity. And then they're also fitted with an onboard computer, so it stores all of that data. And then we fly around with a laptop computer, and then it starts downloading the data. We're looking at the fish streams. What we'd like to know is when these fish numbers go up in these streams, how are these bears, how are the movements changing for these bears? How are they reacting? At what number of fish do they respond and move into the area? So this year is kind of a protocol development. We're gonna try and count all the fish in one or two of these streams using video cameras. The project is also studying the abundance of the other major food source and the effect its variation has on the bears. We're looking at berries. We're trying to develop a monitoring system where we go out annually and collect berry productivity, maybe create an index. The results apply to brown bears everywhere. The distinction between brown bears and grizzlies is just a matter of convenience. Grizzlies are considered to be all brown bears that are in interior areas. Brown bears are considered to be all Ursus arctos that are along coast, and Kodiak falls into that category. These typically have a lot of salmon resources available to them. It's not available to interior brown bears. So most coastal brown bears are larger than interior brown bears. Adaptation accounts for a difference in behavior. Here what you oftentimes find is brown bears or Kodiak brown bears are much more tolerant of each other, at least during certain parts of the season. That's an adaptation so that they can go ahead and exploit concentrated food sources. The study is also unique in following up on downloads from the bear collars. Six volunteers hike out in two-person teams to where the bears have been and collect data on vegetation, bear activity, what they've been eating, and what they've been doing. In the least biased way, we sample the vegetation in the area by running two perpendicular transects that make a cross, a 40-meter cross. And along that transect, we sample the vegetation every two meters. There's no roads and there's no trails. In my experience, it's among the hardest, if not the hardest hiking I've ever done. The mountains, although they're not very tall, are incredibly steep, and the vegetation is just impossibly thick. So moving uphill on something, you're actually in a good position if you're in ferns that are above your head and you have to kick your feet through them to move your legs forward, because other options might be dense willow or alder, or salmonberry, which is essentially a thorn bush that pokes your eyes. The vegetation is incredibly challenging, which makes bears' physical abilities, especially when you see them running or something, all the more impressive. The refuge has a program to bring in promising new biologists. We got strong, well-adaptive, and diverse in their skills. 
volunteers. And so they came out here and are just doing a great job. And I owed all of them, really. We got one volunteer from France who had been working in Africa prior to coming here, a volunteer from Canada who not very long ago was working in China, and then we've got four volunteers from the U.S., and they're all in the 23 to 30-year range. Most of them had never worked with, with bears. My first night out in the field, we were up at a hill camp. And we have a portable electric fence, which runs on two AA batteries that we put around the tent, and it's supposed to deter bears. I woke up in the middle of the night, and the wind was howling, and ordinarily when the fence is functioning properly, you hear a rhythmic, like, and I'd never used these before, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and it would be making a regular ticking noise, and then a little beep. I thought, oh, what's going on with the fence? And so I crawl out of the tent in my underwear, and it's like blasting wind and dark outside, and I don't have a headlamp, and the fence is flashing fault. And so I'm frantically trying to change the batteries. And then I got back in my sleeping bag and woke up for the rest of the night every 10 minutes to listen, to make sure the fence was operating correctly, because I was pretty scared. The next morning, there was a big clump of bear hair right in between where the fence wire goes to the fence post. All food is stored in bear-proof containers, and each volunteer always carries some type of bear deterrent. At least one person carries a 12-gauge shotgun. Nobody's had to fire the shotgun yet. I've encountered bears, I've seen bears, but I don't have any bear stories, and to me that's a good thing because it means I'm doing something right, I'm being diligent, I'm being sensitive to their home and to them being here, and the fact that I'm a guest here in their home, and I, and I respect them. Life for the scientific team centers on Camp Island, an island in Carlick Lake, an hour's flight southwest of the small town of Kodiak. This is where the data entry takes place and where the volunteers recuperate from grueling three to five day camping trips, often in the rain and cold. Everybody here loves being in the backcountry, loves roughing out in the wilderness. And I mean, that's the appeal of being in a place like this. So for us, Camp Island is pretty much Club Med, it's, it's a pretty cushy place. I mean, we have all the amenities, as far as we're concerned, of, of regular life, because, you know, we've got generators, we have power, you know, we have hot showers here, and yes, we go to outhouses to, to go to the toilet, but, um, you know, we've got everything we need. With that said, however, it's funny, because once you spend about two or three days on Camp Island waiting for data processing, you start to get a little antsy. You're ready to hit the field again and, and get in a tent and work hard and get dirty. Evenings at Camp Island bring with them deep discussion of environmentalism, biology, and the odd way this lifestyle is more satisfying than the life back home. Most people opt to leave the refuge only once during their three-month stay, taking an overnight in the town of Kodiak. There they wash clothes in real washing machines, check their email, call family and friends, and drink a beer. The rest of the time, the focus is bears. We saw a saw with two two and a half year olds fishing at the mouth of a creek. Another bear, a young adult, was walking down the beach, and we thought for sure it was gonna get chased off, or there would be a fight, or they'd make a detour. And she came right to the mouth of the creek where the mother was. The cubs were kind of wary of her, kind of standing back, a little bit skittish. But those two just stood up, played, wrestled, almost hugged and mouthed a little bit, and then went down and just continued on. So there's something going on there. <laughs> 